I am back for a second round with one of my all-time favorite people, Jamie Shaw. Jamie, thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Again, for those of you who didn't come last time, Jamie is a can long time cannabis activist, long time writer, uh, highly influential in terms of helping us get to where we are at provincial level, at federal level. I really like uh, Jamie, your influence in my life is something that I always tell you. I thank you for it greatly. And um, yeah, uh, we've done a lot of cool stuff together, but we talked about it a little bit last time. Um, and today, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I, uh, I, I am broadcasting from unceded Musqueam, uh, sorry, uh, uh, specifically this here in, in Burnaby, it would be more so Squamish territory and uh, it's unceded. And Jamie, where are you broadcasting from? I am coming from Richmond, Sea Island. Sea Island, yeah. So we are both broadcasting from Sea Native Territory, and we're going to be talking about a subject matter that is actually, well, basically last time we left all of you at the, let's say, the, the Napoleonic era. Basically, I think, Jamie, the, we left people off. Uh, and I know I'm backtracking a little bit here because I want to make sure that we give everyone a really strong background to what the dis discussion is about and how we came here, you know, cause we are gonna move forward. And essentially we discussed a long history of uh, human beings trying to modernize and civilize themselves by breaking ties with the old ways of thinking and being and cannabis was part of those old ways and thinking of being very tied to matrilineal uh, forms of governance and inside of uh, tribal and, and band networks that humans would have had in the past. And the breaking with all of this tradition of having any matrilineal influence in, in large scale society, of having cannabis be influential in our society in the sense that, uh, well, it never stopped being influential, but uh, in the sense that the intoxicating properties of the plant kind of were pushed aside and not given the, the prominence that they were in previous human cultures. And so we came to the point where we were discussing when the Ottomans were basically trampled by the French and they get extinguished. Uh, they, have their, they have their empire extinguished at that point in history. That's really when the when Ottoman empire really starts to collapse hard. I know that the, they finished collapsing in the second world war. I know that, but, but the collapse is really at that point is, is this moment that Muslim culture has already kind of handed it off to the West a little bit. Now the West has it and the West is about to, well, they're already engaged in a heavy, heavy scheme of colonialism. And uh, I guess that's maybe where we want to backtrack to, Jamie, is that moment where Spain, before the French come into power, mm -hmm. Spain is in control. And they set off this bomb, this bomb of colonialism, of, of movement of the people, right? From the old world to the new world to supposedly establish the new world, right? In, in what was the Americas. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that transition, that moment of transition, you know? Yeah, so I mean, I think we have to backtrack a, a little bit from like the Napoleonic Wars for sure, um, because, you know, it was really the, the 1500s and, and 1600s, Spain in particular, spread out a lot. Um, people don't realize that before the, the sun never set on the British Empire, um, the sun never set on the Spanish Empire, right? And, and the, it wasn't until the Philippines became an American protectorate um, that it wasn't under Spanish rule. You know, Guam has been... Uh, colonized from the beginning. Um, American Samoa, same thing. Cuba, Puerto Rico, those all came from wars with the Spanish with what they had left over. Um, and, you know, I think we, we kind of skipped over the American Revolution too. And I think there's a, a small point to be made here in just how important cannabis really was um, to the militaries, not only to the shipping, you know, um, when Columbus's first three ships came over, they would have had about 80 tons of cannabis um, on, in hemp and, and rigging and sails for the ships. Um, that's a lot, but even when it comes to warfare, people talk about the cannon and, and um, gun technology. During these e e early wars, you needed paper 
to keep the powder dry, it was an extremely important resource. So important that during the American Revolution and the American Civil War, if you worked in a rope factory or a paper factory, both of which dealt with cannabis, you didn't have to fight in the war. They, they would exclude you in the Civil War. It was six months. You work in a rope box six months. You don't have to work at all in the rest of the war. You don't have to serve. It was extremely important for like cloth and fiber. And what it led to were, was explorers. And this is another kind of crazy thing that, that has gone unnoticed. Um, you know, there was an explorer that claimed in the 1500s, he found wild hemp growing in Virginia, early 1500s. Yes. Um, hey, to Cartier, this day, wild hemp in Virginia. Yeah, Cartier, in three separate visits to Canada, said he saw it growing wild in Canada, right? Champlain said he saw it growing wild in Vermont. But the thing people don't understand is Cook also said the same thing when he got to Australia. If you convinced the royalty to give you a whole bunch of money and you went around the world looking for something, by saying you found cannabis, the royalty was like, great, because they're still taxing people. They're forcing people to grow cannabis, right? They're taxing you if you don't grow it. Um, they're still exchanging thread for cannabis. They, they need more cannabis for paper and for rigging and sales. Um, and so all of the explorers lied about finding cannabis in all these places where cannabis did not actually exist at that time. Now, I think we're gonna backtrack way farther to when the Spanish first kind of got to North America so that we can talk about some of the, some of, of what the tribes here experienced with cannabis. And, and there's, there's some debate about whether cannabis was here already before Columbus got here. Um, there, there's not a lot of evidence for it, but there, the evidence that is there, I think can be explained through a very strange little, word game is why words matter so much and it's why when you label something something it can totally change everything so what we were talking a little bit about mitochondrial migration of, of human dna early human migrations and it looks like the first big one that went really far and ended up in hawaii basically all through the south pacific um they didn't encounter cannabis they they were too low uh, in latitude to encounter cannabis the group that's supposed to have come across the Bering Strait and, and populated North and South and Central America, um, they would have been to North. And what's interesting is right around the time that we, we have botanically decided cannabis was evolved and where it evolved is where a third migration kind of sweeped in, like swooped in around and found cannabis. And that's kind of where people found cannabis. Um, so it doesn't look like it came across the Bering Strait. There's, you know, the Vikings, which are a Scythian people, which kind of ties into the title because I noticed we still kept the title of Scythians. Um, so, that, you know, the Vikings came to Newfoundland. Well, they found some archaeans of cannabis in Newfoundland, but they, it, if they planted it, it didn't seem to take off. It didn't seem to go anywhere else. Um, so it does look like it was actually the one good thing Europeans gave Native Americans. <laughs> alcohol, you know, they gave us corn, they gave us potatoes, they gave us, you know, all of this good stuff. And the only good thing we gave them was cannabis. And then as we see over the next few hundred years, we, we make sure that they don't, they're not allowed to use that, right? Um, so yeah, so the Spanish in like, you know, 1500s, they're moving through what's now Mexico and the United States. And uh, this is a group where Actually, before we get to that, I want to kind of talk about the, the word play thing that I just mentioned. I, I knew I was going to nerd out so hard on this. Um, one of the issues with trying to decide if cannabis was here or not was, of course, Native Americans were using all the plants that were here for all kinds of things. One of them that they were using specifically for a lot of cannabis uses, like ropes and fibers for cloth and things like that, um, it's called dog bane. When yeah. Western botanists saw it, they went, oh, it's, um, I can't even remember exactly what. They, they call it Indian hemp, Iranian. Well, yeah, but there's a, there's a scientific term. I think it's acabinum cannabin, cannabium. Cannabium at the end, yes. So it makes Cannabium, it I remember. I'm trying to remember the first part. But I, and anyway, um, this plant then became called Indian hemp because the botanists went, well, it's cannabis, so we'll put cannabium in there. So then people went, oh, it's Indian hemp. But there's 
you know, Native Americans aren't Indians. Indian hemp is a totally different thing from a totally different continent um, that is being used by everybody still, right? Um, at this point, it's, it's still coming up through uh, the Mediterranean. It's not using British trade lines yet, but it's, it's, it's still widely known, particularly in medicine. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, that's it, this, by the way. It's very it is, and that's where we get all this different stuff where cannabis poisons dogs, right? Yeah, I don't believe yeah, cannabis yeah. does poison dogs. I think a cannabis brownie will poison a dog, right? <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, we need research on things like that because, for just that reason, because this plant is very poisonous to dogs and it is poisonous if you smoke, but it can be used for lots of other things, including medicines. Um, and so this weird connection is made, then it's given a name, which is then confused with another name. And the next thing you know, you have this local weed that makes people crazy. <laughs> no. But they don't even know what they mean by the word Indian, let alone hemp, right? Like, both of the words are totally useless in the situation. That's why a lot of my native friends, like, cause, cause I actually dug on it with them. They were like, no, no, my grandparents said we've had, we've had Indian hemp here forever. Yeah. And then we dug on it and we were like, oh, it's dog. How do you say it again? Dog bow. Dog bean. Dog, dog bean is, is a okay, company. Yeah. This yeah. Plant, because they were making the rope out of it. The yeah. Europeans were like, oh, that's your version. And, of and it's a good diet. And it genetically unrelated. It wasn't cannabis at all. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then, of course, you know, we see, you know, and this is the other problem with it is because Cannabis was adopted early, right? It was adopted almost as soon as it was here. 1600, right? boom. Like. So we're already talking hundreds of years. So when you say, oh yeah, you know, my, my grandparents knew about this. Well, at that point, it could be anything. It could be real cannabis. It could have been, yeah. we, don't, we don't actually know because of yeah. the way that we've worded things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it obfuscates the past even more. And you know Absolutely. what? I wasn't aware, this, is, this was a recent occurring to me. I, I, for a long time, just thought that a lot of Native people have these oral traditions that maybe were exaggerating the time length for mm. which they had been making ropes and string from oh, yeah. this plant. And that's where I realized that I had just got my nomenclature mixed up. Uh, that's all it was, really. But yeah, well, not just you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, everybody. Like, that's, yeah. that's now the problem is because things written you know, yeah, you don't know what 100 to 500 years ago, we don't know what they're, you know, we have no idea what they're talking about, which leads to something else we were just talking about oh. um, just before in different, in, in, in terms of different nomenclatures for cannabis. And, and we were talking about Maria Rosa. Do you want to Sure. Well, I think Maria Rosa, uh, I've been doing a lot of investigation over the years about the true origins of the word marijuana because it shares the phonetic basis with ma, which is hemp in Chinese, which is a very ancient and very important symbol for them. It symbolizes house, symbolizes so many things for the Chinese. Chinese symbols can be used in many different ways depending on the context. So there's always been the theory that uh, at some point, be because Chinese people have been so prolific in spreading both opium and cannabis all throughout the planet, um, there are some of the people that, I mean, took it with them and uh, many folks believe that they they really started it up in South Africa, uh, even though we have other indications that it actually made its way its way to South Africa via other trade routes as well with Indians mm -hmm. and otherwise. But um, ma, that phonetic voice, which a lot everyone just assumes that it is the base of marijuana in, in the Americas, we we can't trace it clearly, and there's so much obfuscation because Native Americans were using so many different types of plants all at the same time. So when they refer to Maya Rosa today, today in Hidalgo, there is a group of, of uh, natives that are called Otomis, which I already knew about for a long time, but it was only until this episode that I did more research and found out that today they still use the terminology Santa Rosa, Rosa Maria, Maria Rosa, depending on which specific area around the Central Valley of Mexico you're in and which specific tribe or group or band you're with, okay? And they, to, to this day, they're doing the procession and the primary herb utilized in that procession, which is part of a new, it's a post-colonial religion that developed there that you were talking about, Jamie, mm -hmm. in which cannabis has assumed a very important ritualistic role. I mean, the shaman consumes it during the ritual becomes so intoxicated and worked up into the, it's not really the intoxication of the plant, but more so the chanting, the singing, the drumming, everything that happens that works them up into a fervor, into, into a vision that they can talk to the spirits and then have that 
relationship through the shaman for everyone that's there, the bigger group that's talking to the spirits thanks to their communion with this plant. Obviously, it's very, very reminiscent of uh, shamanic practices that revolve around peyote and other types of, we use a lot of salva divinorium. If any of you out there haven't had concentrated forms of salvia, um, it's quite the experience. And definitely you could see how all of these plants were used to communicate with, uh, with the gods. But, um, but Jamie, this phonetic base, how, uh, you know, the first time that I ever read it, I don't know if maybe you can confirm this, but the earliest uh, indication is around 1876, I think it was the, the pharmacist in Guadalajara that says that young people in Guadalajara, he calls them, of course, nativos and mestizos, right? Are, that means that the native people and the mixed kids that he saw them smoking a cigarette. So the first ever indication of a joint being smoked on planet Earth is this guy, this pharmacist, who's a more white perplexion pharmacist, some guy from Guadalajara that looks like me, complaining about the brown kids smoking a joint on the corner. Oh, they're smoking my, this thing we call Maya Rosa. And to this day, people in Hidalgo still call it Maya Rosa. So we have basically what I like to call some ethnobotanical evidence that Maria Rosa, which is being written about in the 1800s was definitely cannabis, okay? Cannabis sativa as the scientists like to refer to them. And so that opens up a whole interesting, well, yeah, because I mean, do you agree, Jamie, that that's around the time period that we have the firm indication is before the revolution that- Absolutely, and, and the word marijuana itself, the first kind of attestation we can find is in Pancho Villa's camp, which, you yeah, know- marijuana. Yeah, marijuana, yeah. Pancho Villa, and I love that. But um, there's there's like so many interesting points here. So there's a group of people called the Hayaki or the Yaqui. Um, I that's wrote about them pretty heavily in that, in that um, Pancho Villa piece. They, they believe in peyoteism and um, they, they have a very unique history because when they met the Spanish, they didn't subdue, you know, they, they didn't get the smallpox ap epidemics, first of all, that a lot of other native peoples got. Um, we, we don't know why, they just didn't seem to suffer from it about the same. Um, and they really held their ground. And what's interesting is, so they first come into contact with Spain in 1533. And there's like some odd conflicts that go right up until 1927. They're bombed by the Mexican military, the Air Force. Um, so they maintained independence. They still do to this day, to a degree. They're within the borders of Mexico, within the country of Mexico, but they do kind of have a pretty large chunk of land. Um, but they had to fight for that. But what's really interesting is that um, these people that believed in peyoteism um, and had very similar, you know, rituals where the music, the drug that was being consumed, the chanting, the dancing, all kind of led to the exact same, sometimes even the environment if they were in a cave or, or different um, ceremonial places. And so there's this weird thing that happens still in the 1500s where while the Hayaki are still fighting for independence and will be for centuries, their religion becomes syncretized with Christianity. And it's weird because it's like, they're not very similar religions at all. There's very little to explain it because they're the ones that actually asked the Jesuits to come in. And for like the next two centuries, they actually enjoyed a lot of autonomy. Um, the, both the Jesuits and, and the Acqui were actually benefiting from the relationship. It wasn't until the Jesuits got kicked out that things went south again. And then the Mexican revolution where the Mexican government persecuted them even more. Um, okay. But this tribe syncretized their, their, their religion very early with Christianity. And one of the only kind of things that makes any sense is Maria Rosa or Santa Rosa. Because Santa Rosa is, is Mary. It's a personification of the Virgin Mary, right? And it's Jesus's mother. And the fact that it was acquainted with, acquainted with a plant, which may have even been their doing. We don't know who, whether it was the Jesuits who said it or whether they were the ones who said it, but somebody made that connection. And because of that, everything makes sense for the Hiaki. And so they actually adopt a lot of Christian iconography. They believe flowers in general come from the blood of Christ, you know, fall into the ground at the crucifixion. Um, you know, there's a lot of beliefs that don't really make sense unless you understand it actually jibes with all the old beliefs that they hold as well, that they, that they syncretize with it, right? And so they don't necessarily believe in a heaven, a purgatory and a hell. And, and, you know, they do believe in Christ, but not the way that most other Christian religions do. And so 
by inviting the Jesuits in, Jesuits set up a mission. This is where the Spanish grew all of their cannabis in North America was on the missions. So these people, we have a link, like that we know that they're connected very, very early with this plant. Um, and it may very well have played a large role in, in the, the creation of their modern version of their religion. And you know, what's interesting is that if you think about it, because I, you know, until you told me today, Jamie, that Maria Juana, as in Mary, and John Mary is married to John. Yeah. That's Which what is, he, yeah. Mary yeah. and John. As in, as in, because think about it, right? Like how quickly cannabis assumes a role of being the sacrament of God in Rastafarian religion as well, which is another post-colonial American. I never religion. stopped in Ethiopian Gnostic religions, right? Exactly. exactly. And yeah, it's transferred exactly from, from that Ethiopian current. Yeah. And I oftentimes wonder how much African culture, because think about it, right? Like natives and Africans in America, for example, in, in uh, the Southern states of Mexico, we have all of these colonies that still exist today, mm -hmm. much like some of the colonies in Jamaica where it's colonies of runaway slaves that actually met the natives and they, they lived together for a long time and they became one people. Mm -hmm. and, and to this day, their identity is they're like, no, we're black and we're native and, and the natives ran away from the Spaniards the blacks ran away from the Spaniards and we came together, we created our own community here that was resilient and that said, fuck you to the world, quite isolated. And they still, to this day, a lot of those people live there, have those identities and hold true to it. And I oftentimes wonder how influential those Ethiopian currents were in placing cannabis as the sacrament of God in native. Oh, I think extremely, yeah, religion. no. Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, definitely in Rastafari. I think in oh, native, sure. they, well, they found sure. it themselves. I think, I think you know, they, they encounter this new people that come and they've got all these new weights, right? And we think they're fascinated by guns and all of this stuff. And sure, it would be kind of interesting to see if you'd never seen a gun before, you'd be like, what the fuck was that, right? So, I mean, it would be a little surprising, but the other thing is they took plants with them. You know, colonists, at first they didn't even plant food. Like the, the one of the running, you know, jokes of history is, is the natives watching the Jamestown colony, which failed at first, going, well, they're planting all these things, but it's not food. No, it was cannabis, right? And so watching people behave like that, you're, and especially if you are attuned to the plants around you, this is a new plant coming into the environment that's being provided for some reason. Um, that's usually the framework around um, the belief of plants in all religions, even in the Bible, God's right at the beginning. He's like, I give you the plants and herbs. Like that's every culture on earth pretty much believes that plants were given by a god or a creator or a protector right and so if this new plant appears of course you're going to experiment with it the same way in western culture the problem was there was a divide already and it was the botanists that were studying it right and they were studying that and you know doctors might study it from the botanists in terms of pharmaceutical preparations and tinctures where it's mixed with alcohol right but the idea of rolling it up and smoking it that is a very north american in South American, Central American idea. Nobody else in the world figured that out, right? Neither cigars or cigarettes. I think a lot of people don't realize that the most no. common way that we use to consume cannabis was invented very likely, uh, Jamie, if not the Yakis, somebody around the Yakis yeah. around that time. Yeah. Uh, we don't know exactly which native group first did it. No. But we know for sure that the Spaniards got it from the natives. Spaniards took it back to, to Europe. The French were like, huh? Because the, the French were getting powerful at that time. Tobacco, like the idea of smoking. Yeah. Yes. The yes. French were the high, also viewed in all of Europe as all oh, the wealthy, the high class, whatever the French are doing. They modernized it. Yeah. yeah. That the, exactly. effectively turned it into a consumer product. Yeah. Exactly. So I think the world is totally forgotten that it's a Native American contribution. That is yeah, well, and I think I, we were, when we were talking last week or so, I, I think I'd mentioned this is another thing that really bugs me is that so the Americans had, had all these different kinds of, of tobacco plants that they were using and, and for different purposes and mixed with different plants. And Europeans come along and go, oh, tobacco, huh? They, they experiment with a couple of different strains. They go, this is the one that we think is the most productive. And they start dumping chemicals on it, like chemical after chemical after chemical, right? Um, and you know, when it says your cigarettes come with 70 toxic cancer-causing you know, chemicals, most of those were added. 
right? Like they were things that we put on it knowing that that's what happens. Then everybody starts smoking. A bunch of people make a bunch of money. And finally, you know, doctors and governments are going, well, shit, we've got people dying and this isn't good. We've got to like fix this up because they're not just dying. They're dying and placing a heavy strain on healthcare. So, you know, we've got to stop this tobacco smoking. And now we've got this idea that any smoke is totally toxic, right? And, and it, it's, a, it's kind of a, a perpetu self-perpetuating loop where you're like, oh, well, the natives use smoke for purification and they smoked things. Well, they must have been idiots because smoke is toxic. But it's like they didn't prepare it that way. They didn't treat it that way. They didn't smoke it that way. That, that was all Europeans, right? That was all white people that did that. So, And I think uh, the last time we talked about this, I also pointed out to you how how important smoke curing is in native culture. I think that like in other cultures, we smoke our peppers, we smoke our meat, we smoke our chicken, we smoke everything. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that in the context of food preparation, smoke is purify purifying, it is. It diminishes the amount of microbiology and prevents it from developing. It's scientifically an accurate thing to say about smoke. So the concept that smoke can only be damaging to to two animal tissues um because the tobacco smoke is right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's something also like we we have a very limited metaphysical understanding of the world in western society because metaphysics is philosophy to us yeah. and to native people it's i think that they went a little bit deeper into the science of the spirit the science of the psyche as detached from the body the science of again the spirits that's why i like to call it you know and i know that Folks don't think that spirituality and science is compatible, but from a Native American perspective, that's not the case. No, and if you take it far enough, they should be. That's that's kind of the whole point. I mean, there was a one of, one of my favorite anecdotes actually involves the Hopi, who are a little bit north of the tribes that we were talking about now, um, and. Uh, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s, when quantum theory started developing, people realized there was a serious problem with the English language because using a language that has a time tense built into it, past, present, future, that there's no way to get around it in the language at all. And, and quantum physicists were going, well, this actually can't be accurate. Like we actually need a language that explains space time, not, not time is this weird thing that is like built into every single communication you have, it needed to be separated. And, and Einstein's concept of space time or Minkowski space before him, it, it requires a different kind of thinking than the English language can have, really. And, and they, they found that that was one of the biggest barriers to, to advancing quantum theories further. They then studied all these languages and found, well, the Hopi language is actually the closest. Of all the ones they studied on Earth, the Hopi language actually expresses quantum principles perfectly without any problems with the time tense and because they literally equated time and space in the way that it took us until the 1900s to do. I think that it's uh, the concept you're, I read about this that, and it's funny also because there's so many aspects to the Hopi culture that make you go, huh? Yeah. Like how much they focus on the study of stars, mm -hmm. how much they understand about the movement of the celestial bodies, yeah. their concept of, their concept of, of the psyche within the context of time space is mind boggling because you, you hear the, the, what the elders are teaching and you're like, this is quantum theory to the T, yeah. to the T. And of course, also like, you know, what, what I love the most is how native cultures manage to make religion useful. <laughs> you know how, you know how when I, when, cause I'm a Catholic. Okay. So we have the most, as a, as a little four-year-old boy, I was like, mama, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you go, I'll tell you one experience that changed my life that my mother went through the same thing it was the first time I was taken to church when I was a little boy. I noticed that the white people sat at the front in the chairs and that the natives sat on the floor and that they were, they didn't have any shoes. Most, a lot of them that you'd get out of the church and you would beg, they would, they would beg for money out right outside the church. And I thought to myself, like, what kind of God is this that, that thinks that this world is the just world because mm -hmm. you know the way that the native thought their they, their concept of celestial justice and good and evil was 
much more evolved than ours. We are, we, well, I, mean, I see our, our, our systems of thought like the system of thought of little kids still. You know, this, little, is one of the, one of, children. this is one of the things that kind of depresses me at times because it's just like, it's just such a big issue. Um, but it's like, when you study how these religions formed and how religions were shaped over the years, and it's like, when you study early Christianity and see how many different factions of Christianity they were at the very beginning, it's like, there's a lot now, but it got narrowed down to like two first before then expanding out again, basically using just those two as, as sort of a basis. And um, if you go far enough back, it's like we were smarter. You know, we were smarter in, in different ways, right? Yeah, like, ways. you know, expressions like one of the things that I love is, is you know, we talk about the tide rolling in and, and um, you know, it does kind of seem to roll, but when you actually study the molecules, they're specific, that they are exactly rolling in, right? Um, people kind of make fun of witchcraft, even though a lot of it is actually, you know, what their understanding of witchcraft is, is comes from the people that were trying to kill all the witches and they're still benefiting from witchcraft in modern medicine every single day of their lives. So they were really understanding it. And, you know, some of the basic principles were the seven hermetic principles, which is also the foundation of science, right? Oh. And so it's, it's, I think it's a different way of looking at it. Like they were looking at a much bigger macro view and we are increasingly trying to find smaller. Right, like we're we're trying to find the micro view of how exactly does this work in a technical way, without you know the bigger understanding. Like, and, and again, I think this is partially a language problem with with um, you know English and Romantic languages in particular kind of being so prevalent at least in this part of the world. Um, is that th there are foundational issues built right into the language itself. And, um, you know, I think this comes up a lot, but when it comes to English, for example, if you look at new words that are created, almost all of them are technical based, right? They're all, you know, they're, they're based on a machine. It's a machine. It's like, what does a machine do? Or, you know, we're, we're not coming up with new artistic words very often, right? Like in Shakespeare's day, you could sit down and, you know, invent a ton of the words that we still use today. Nobody really does that anymore. They might have a little quip that's like witty and makes sense at the time, but isn't really going to be a contribution to language long term. And so we've fallen into this almost Prussian, very mechanical way of thinking about things that has been very beneficial for some things, but has been too divorced from, from a bigger picture for too long. Right? And it doesn't look like anytime soon we're gonna kind of marry those again. Um, like a, a good example that I like is, is um, I don't know much about baseball, but I do know this little antidote is that um, in English it's called a curveball because that's the technicality of how it flies, it curves, right? In French, it's called the butterfly bowl because that's kind of what it looks like in flight. Right? And so even these two languages that are heavily influenced each other for hundreds of years um, and come from some of the same source languages to begin with um, have still a completely different way of looking at the world. And it's, and it's tied up in languages, which is one of the reasons why for me, my whole life, I, I hate like, you know, people don't understand there are thousands of languages in North America alone before you even get into Central or South America. And most of them have now been wiped out and gone and they teach us things. Um, there was a study at the University of Calgary is probably about 10, 15 years ago now, where they were looking at ginger because uh, a Blackfoot word for ginger translates as a device for the heart. And they found out that ginger is actually good at preventing heart disease, right? And so there's there's all of this knowledge, right? From the beginning of time, knowledge that humans have gathered that's encoded in languages, and we just wipe them out with abandon. Right? Like we don't even record them most of the time. So it's it, it's you know, it's we're definitely advancing as a species, but you know, we're also losing a lot as we do it. It's we're we're like transitioning from one way of thinking about the universe to another. And at this midpoint, it's not enough. Right? It's, not, it's not enough to kind of explain everything, which is, you know, I, I, another kind of example of this is special and general relativity. It's like there's still no unified theory of everything. We can look at things small and we can look at things big, but we don't, we don't get how it connects yet, right? So that's a bit of a rant, sorry. No, it's okay, it's okay. I, I feel that like it's a subject matter that is difficult not to rant on. Yeah. And definitely like it's a... It's uh, pretty amazing to me, at least, 
having come from a country where we have a lot of we have a lot of neglect around the preservation of any type of traditional language. Uh, we have some of the most, the stronger forms of culture, uh, the stronger languages, the stronger language systems still endure and they are well preserved. And people really uh, have a lot of uh, pride around the preservation of that in my country. There's people that are really, they have the blood and they're from there and you know they're gonna make sure it doesn't die out. One of the places that I spent a lot of time in was in Yucatan. Mm -hmm. And to get to know Maya people, because you know, here's a good point. Uh, cannabis never really took a uh, good root in Yucatan. The, the culture, the Mayan culture, uh, they'll tell you that cannabis was not part of their traditional repertoire of plants because they actually have very well-preserved memory of what plants they, keep in mind that to, uh, to a person from that part of the world, uh, in order to graduate to a higher level in society, you had to go to a school of enlightenment or a school for a specific goddess or God, and you would literally go to learn how to use plants. That's what you would learn. Mm -hmm. As a native person, uh, the head of the group, of any group, you know about the plants because it's part of like, you know how we learn math in high school? That's, they, they get math and then they get that too, okay? And then they know where the planets are and how to guide themselves on the planets, all the stuff that we don't have anymore, okay? It's technology that basically lost. Um, and I think that it's really interesting to me how that pride and that memory that is held is like their medicine and it's what allows them to endure despite the fact that the world says they don't exist. I don't know if any of you have read about Mayans and Yucatan, but what you will read in your notebook is that the Spaniards came, that the Mayans were gone. It was the biggest mystery. They disappeared and they left Chichen Itza and they left all of these amazing sites and there were no people there. It's all bullshit. All of it is whitewash form of history. When you go to Yucatan today to Chichen Itza, look, they don't have weed. They don't have cannabis, so it's difficult for me to envision myself living there permanently, okay? I said that to my Mayan. I love, Mayans have this way. So, you know, my mother now lives in Yucatan. She lives not in Yucatan, but in Quintana Roo, which is right next to Yucatan. She just decided to move there permanently. And, you know, one of the things that made her move is that the Native people in the rest of the country, they always call us Senora, Senor. Um, they talk with a lot of... I always, they talk to you because they know you're wealthy. So they talk to you differently. They treat you differently. And Yucatan is not like that. In Yucatan, they don't call you señora, señor, no, no. ¿Qué pasó tú? They call you by tú, which means no, no, no usted. Usted is very appropriate. They say, hey, you, what's up? How you doing? Hey, you, what can I, what are you doing here? What's your name? Hey, you, they talk to you like they're you. Mm. Because they know that they are the people that were born in that land, that own the land. They, they've kicked out the, the, the police from the, federal, the federales and the army so many times out of that state yeah. that yeah. the central government has a lot of respect for them. They say, no, fuck, don't mess with the Mayans, please, because the Mayans are very united and there's a shit ton of them. And if they get angry, we're going to have a fucking military situation on our hands. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of people forget that, A, we're still denying that these people even exist and there's millions of them, mm -hmm. okay? We're just now with LIDAR technology beginning to recognize that the sites that we thought had 200,000 people, no, 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 they had 2.5 million people, okay? That the whitewashing of what this culture was and the magnitude of this culture also gives us a really good tool to understand cannabis history because there's a lot of native groups that are gonna tell you from the Amazon as well as from North America, they're gonna be like, no, we had the ganja forever for thousands of years and we have to respect their old traditions and not be like, ha, you're an idiot because archeologists say, fuck that. That's not the right way to approach it. No. What we do need to know is that there's a lot of folks that come from groups that will tell you straight up that it's not part of our tradition, but, but even the Mayans who are very anti-drugs, the Mayans, if you're the drunk of the town, you're gonna be the laughing stock of the town. And when, I, when they found out that I smoke cannabis, everybody looked at me differently. 
They were like, ah, oh, Adolfo el Marihuano. Oh, this guy loves weed, you know? But because Mayans, it's not normal for Mayans to be stoners. Mm. Not normal for them to consume peyote. Not normal for them to have a shaman that goes into a trance. That's not their culture. Yeah. That's not their culture. That's people from other parts of Americas, okay? Their culture was bloodletting. Their culture was sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Their culture was things that were very common to the central valleys of Mexico and Mesoamerica as a whole. Bloodletting and sacrifice were central to most cultures in America. And uh, it really gives us a good understanding that, hey, when you go to S S South America, do the native people talk about cannabis the same way down there? Mm -hmm. Does the archeological data show the same type of, because you know, Jamie, about the cocaine mummies, which later, very few people know about this. Uh, Bala Banova, I believe is her name. Mm -hmm. Very famous. Uh, I believe she's German. Yes, she was German and she, she, German Jew, I believe. And she actually found traces of cocaine on the Egyptian, on the Egyptian mummies. Mm -hmm. And then same lady did another study that very few people know about. She went to the mummies that were about from 200 BC to 600 AD in Peru. And she tested those mummies. And what did she find in Peru? Well, they also used some cocaine for mummification, but she found traces of hashish and mm -hmm. cannabis dating to 200 BC up to 500 AD. And that's well, where you go. There's still a whole theory that hasn't been explained that, that possibly the, the lost tribe of, of Israel came over. Right. Um, there's theories that maybe some of the Phoenicians made it over, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, you know, on the other side, it's even more interesting because it's like, you know, when you go to Hawaii, I, I, I did not know this. Um, they're big war canoes, historically. They were built out of trees that came from the Pacific Northwest. That's, those were the they trees. They, they would float, Jamie? They would float, In yeah. Hawaii? Yes, they would end up washing up on the shores. Um, of course, they found all of these, like they found Japanese and Chinese pottery shards that are really old all along um, the west coast of, of South America and Peru. Um, so it's like, you know, when we talk about these things, I think we, we tend to forget that things aren't a monolith, right? And that there, there have been plenty of starts and stops in our evolution, right? Where, you know, an idea will catch on somewhere and it'll spread somewhere else, but then it'll kind of die off. And then it'll catch on yeah. somewhere else over here. Yeah. And then it becomes really huge and everybody does it. And it's like, but, you know, there's, humans are fascinating creatures, right? Like we really are interesting as a species. Um, Especially when you start looking at early migrations and early, like we're not, we're not a nice species. Like, now, you know, one of the things that, that people also kind of sometimes forget is, is just how much of an impact we just have literally as a species way before we started, you know, paving everything over and, and drilling to the bottom of the ocean for oil way before we started doing any of that. Um, there's a reason why large mammals only exist in India and, and, and Africa. And that's because of us, because they used to exist everywhere. And when the first humans would get there, they would kill them all. And, that, and that's been repeated over and over and over again. You know, the, uh, the mammoth, um, there's an island, I, I can't remember what, what the island's called, but it's in, in uh, Russia's Arctic Circle. And this mammoth survived hundreds of years after the last mammoth until people got there. People got there, and within within a decade, they were gone. Right? Um, North America used to be covered with large animals before humans got here. As soon as humans got here, we, we killed them all off. Like whether we did it on purpose or accident, who knows? Um, but the only large, an large animals left were given time to live with us. Right? They they were given time to kind of evolve, and of course, there, there's not a lot of any of them left. They're all dwindling and have been for centuries, but. Um, at least they gained some survival instincts and, in, you know, about dealing with us specifically that let them to survive this long, at least. Yeah. Way off topic now, but. Yeah, no, no, it all connects, but it's just so interesting how, how that spread of culture happens so quickly. And like you said, how fast it continues to change and evolve and spread and go out. Mm. And so a hundred years, so many things could have happened. And it becomes a little blur when you're talking about thousands of years back yeah. and then identifying that that actually occurred is, you know, it's a needle in a haystack.
Yeah, know? especially when you're talking about plant fibers, right? Like, of yeah. course, like that's that's one of the most notorious issues with trying to do um, anything archaeologically or historically placing cannabis is it's a plant. It's not it's not going to last forever unless it's in very specific sort of circumstances, right? So exactly, yeah, yeah. They they break down. I mean, fortunately, our technology nowadays is just getting so crazy. Every year, archaeology is just taking such huge leaps because of it, man. It's nuts. I never thought that they could analyze. One of the most recent ones that I read was how they're able to analyze feces residues at the bottom of lake and yeah. basically determined, yeah, they, then now they're able to determine that some sites were occupied so much earlier than they were previously mm -hmm. all over Mesoamerica just by looking at, well, humans were here in large quantity based on the fact that we, we can find miniature trace elements of their feces in the lakes and, and riverbeds around where they were. It's so crazy how, yeah. I really think that uh, that as we continue to move forward and technology continues to improve in those microfibers, those residual seeds, everything, if cannabis was here before uh, colonization, we're probably going to find out at some point. And, up to, and I think that the number one thing that now is pretty much for sure is that even if it came it did not leave as an enormous of a cultural impact in the Americas as it did in India and Central Asia. That's sure. something that would be beyond debate because there's not any reference to it in writing or in symbolism or in pictures. Yeah. So, so even if it was there, it didn't create the impact that it did in the old world until we had colonization. And that's something that I think is is beyond the date, right? Yeah, absolutely. And but I think also, I mean, it, it is a pretty glaring exception, right? Like there are, you know, it's it's cannabis made a large impact pretty much universally to the areas that it went. The exactly. Only, the only two places that it didn't, interestingly enough, again, we were talking about the, the mitochondrial migrations were those first two large waves of, of uh, humans that, that spread out. That's when you look at those cultures, those are the ones that didn't have a huge impact on cannabis until way later because that's the right. other interesting thing if you think right. about hawaii 25,000, right jamie twenty five thousand years of first wave at uh at 12 000 years ago the second wave right? yeah right. around around there they guess you know they think right but, but 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 we also don't know if cannabis had evolved to its full form by that point well, that's it. Really it doesn't seem to have, it doesn't seem to have been encountered by humans anywhere until hindu and, and yellow river valley which was that was only populated later, right? After those first two waves went out. And, um, you know, the, the other interesting thing that, that I, I think about that is that, so these two groups of early humans seem to have missed it. And then we found it and it spread everywhere really quickly where it could go. And then as soon as it did actually make it to those other people, they ended up having some of the largest impact. Um, when you look at uh, Taiwan or, or Thailand, um, which was, you know, this is the whole other thing that people, you know, when we talk China in particular, people don't understand the northern half has a much longer history of it than the southern half. Um, Vietnam, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, you'd think they've had cannabis forever, but they, it actually came to them very late. Right. And same, same with Hawaii. I mean, people only got there around 980. Cannabis came to Hawaii very late. But if you look at these places, Thailand, um, Hawaii, you know, Mexico and Central America, you get the places that had the biggest impact. It's like they, they, they encountered it the latest, but they actually have had huge impact. Um, on, on cannabis use and, and Buddhism and, um, you know, cannabis use in, 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 well, cannabis use around the world, right? Because the, when, when the French brought the hash back from Egypt, that caught on a little bit, right? People weren't running out to buy hash and, and, you know, it was just very few people that were doing it. It was artists. It was, it was novelists, right? But once you introduce the joint and, and especially when it came into, into Western mainstream culture around the jazz era, um, you know, between 1900 and 1937, um, that's when you see a massive change in an attitude towards cannabis um, and in the usage of cannabis. So that's something that no human had ever done like that before and so cannabis is this beautiful dichotomy of, of it's something brand new in some ways that we've only really you know had about 100 years experience with in this format but we've got you know thousands and thousands and thousands of years of history with it in in multiple other formats mm -hmm. and and it throws us for a loop you make that one little change and say here's a here's a slightly different format 
And, you know, suddenly governments are freaking out all around the world. And, and you know, it's, it's led to, like, I mean, when people talk about prohibition and all of the harms it's caused, I mean, just the money to enforce it and to come up with the regulations and write the regulations and change the regulations and write the regulations again, just that amount of money is astronomical. Well, I mean, and what's most infuriating is I have to say this because I can't help myself, but when I worked in Sinaloa, it's no secret that the CIA purposefully, like they flew down. This is the, this is the thirties and the forties. Okay. Oh, yeah. they, they fly. To, yeah. So the, the Mexican revolution's over. Okay. Keep in mind that the Americans basically started the Mexican revolution to favor first. They favored this side and they favor that side. They, they bet on both sides. Whoever wins, we're going to win. To be okay. fair, to be fair, the Mexican revolution is crazy. It's a crazy okay. period of time. You've got, You've got the Catholic Church fighting against the government at one point. Right. Well, that, that's it's not. yeah, it, it's a it's considered a separate war. But yes, you're right that the Catholics were part of it. Catholic, no, the history of the Catholics waging war on the state of Mexico is something that the Catholics really don't want anyone to know about. Because <laughs> if you find out, if you find out, because I know people that descended from people that were part of the militaries that were. Trust me, the Opus Diem and all those fucking people, man. You don't, you don't know, you don't know how crazy these some of these Christian Columbus, folk are. are like, Columbus, people are like, oh, the Knights of Columbus, they're like Shriners. Yeah, well, well they no. run guns and supply money to. And, and, and Guadalajara, which is where I consider, just so you know, I consider the, the narco movement to be the nouveau version of the Christian revolts in, mm. within Mexico, mm. because I mean, so. And for those of you who might be Latino out there, I know Sammy, you're there right now, that we call them Las Cristiadas, okay? In Spanish, Las Cristiadas. And there it's a sequence of wars that happens. Um, some of them happen right before the revolution. Some of them happen after the revolution. They, uh, they sprout up here and there in different parts of the nation, but mostly they have to do with groups tied into the federal, sorry, the, the church uh, operating. The biggest one comes out of Guadalajara, which is right next to my town. And uh, basically, uh, the, the real issue with this entire time period, I think, is that people forget that the Americans and the church are pulling on the society. Yes, the, the privileged Mexicans as well, but the privileged Mexican has an authentic desire at this time period to want to make things, so many of them are authentically wanting to make things better because they're the ones that are going to benefit if the country goes better. So the Americans have no interest in them getting powerful. The Europeans at the time are trying to destabilize that relationship between Mexico and the Americans because the Europeans, especially the Germans, they want to come in and make sure that, you know, the Germans uh, and the French yeah, before them. But right? the Americans so, had already been doing, like, I mean, this is the other so, thing people don't understand. Americans had already been fucking with Mexicans for ages. It's like uh, how they got Texas, well, how they well, got California, it's how they got Nevada. Exactly. Actually, like 24% of the continental United States belonged to Mexico before the Mexican Revolution, right? And, and, and so now I work in Jamaica and I'm learning the history of Jamaica and I'm understanding that the CIA has purposefully destabilized their country because they don't want them to turn communist, even though the communist party is doing fantastic in that fucking country because everybody's disenchanted with the West and all the promises that the gringos make them. And all of the countries that I become familiar with, Haiti, all of them that I become familiar with, I end up finding the same thing. The Americans today are not the Americans in the 70s. This is not the Nixonian era. The government of today and the people that run that government are a totally different brand of human being. They think differently. Internally, they acknowledge what they've done. Internally, they are ashamed. Externally, they have never acknowledged externally they cannot show shame Same with for those of us that are argentinians chileans brazilians uh bolivians all of us have had our cultures completely mangled by these cia operations that are still unbeknownst to the to the textbooks and i think it's really important that we acknowledge the fact that the drug war and that cannabis has been a primary touch point for them to conduct these operations because think about it. See, after the revolution, CIA goes to Sinaloa and they tell the people that aren't gangsters at that time, at that time, we don't have a narco, okay? The narco doesn't exist, okay? The CIA creates the narco and the CIA allows the narco to continue to grow and to increase power and to move things across the border when they, the CIA has, has 
empowered individuals to receive those drugs, transform them into money so they can go buy guns or go buy planes or go buy whatever the fuck they need to do for their black ops. And people don't understand that governments still fundamentally work the same way today and that the drug war still funds black operations in that country. And guess what? Maybe in Canada too, because we like to think that Canada is so different than the States, but our government is not free of blood on their hands. I can guarantee you. I'm not gonna go there in this session, but because Jamie, you know what I'm talking about. It's not just the, the recent atrocities no, it's, that, have, that have become public because you and I knew about those atrocities way before they became public. I'm talking about things that haven't got into the textbook, things that happened to friends of mine in university. Yeah. Well, happened on the anti-Olympic committee People super were raided and put in their homes and put into a, a jail cell without any without the rcmp ever saying we put them in jail without yeah. the rcmp ever, and that happened five ten years ago 15 years ago people don't and, understand the tactics either right like the the, the so it's like we're, we're jumping way back again but even something just as simple as a border where canada and, and america decide to put their sorry. border well, oh, you picked a parallel. Well, that's interesting that it just happens to bisect some of the strongest, most independent native right. tribes, right? In the, right? Oh, For the what a coincidence. We were talking about earlier. What a coincidence. As far as we can kind of tell, they've never numbered over 30,000 people, even though they carried on like a five century war um, and held on to their independence this entire time. Um, you know, they, their land has, it's in two states in Mexico and two states in, in, America, right? I mean, it's just oh, it's just a coincidence. It's just you know political expediency or whatever. And it's like these are planned long-term goals, and and Canada is absolutely not blameless in any of that kind of strategy. No, and uh, it's still this is this is the thing. It's going on right yeah. now. Yeah, that's the problem, and we're all watching. A and the histories of all of these people are actively being denied. Yeah. Well, after coup, after, after, coup, after, coup, after coup, this, this morning, uh, you know, about the agreement between Health Canada and Kahnawake. I mean, I think that's great. I'm surprised it wasn't Akwesasne. I kind of wanted it to be Akwesasne first. But, um, you know, e even that, and people are like, well, great, it's a first step. And I was like, yes, it's a, it's a good first step. Um, but it's like, it's not addressing some of the basic, basic issues of, of who has jurisdiction. Right? Who has jurisdiction over these practices? Why, why does the federal government have jurisdiction over the sovereign nation on this one issue? Why does the provincial government have jurisdiction? Oh, you know, and so that's, that's going to take us a while to figure out. Uh, and, and the whole time it's being done under this pressure that keeps pushing it one way, one way, one way to the point where you're like, okay, we'll follow all of Health Canada's rules for everything, but we'll be independent. Great. Go for it. Right? And it's like, well, that's not really... You know, that's not really sovereignty, but. No, no. You know what? One thing that I, I do have to say that makes me happy about the way that our government, you know how they're very neglectful. And one thing that I don't mind about the neglectfulness is how they've allowed native groups in Canada to engage in the production and sale of cannabis on their land. And up to now have kept raids to a minimum and have kept hands off. I'm hoping that things continue yeah. to go this way where we I can. Mean, have I, I hope so too, but you know, when we met with Farnsworth, when I was at Indigenous Bloom, who's now getting sued by Manitoba for running a retail there, um, when we met with Farnworth here in BC, it, it was very interesting because he didn't really give a shit. He just wanted to make sure that anybody coming from off the reservation still paid tax. It was literally all they cared about, right? Like, oh, yeah, fine, go ahead, do it. But you know, we don't want people coming from off the reservation and, and not having to pay tax on, on the cannabis. And it's like, what, how, how big a number do you think that is? Right? Like, I, I mean, it's huge if their rules are that much better, right? Like the only reason you'd be afraid of that is if you think all of the shoppers are gonna go to the reserve, kind of like they are in Tayandanaga, right? Which tells you there's a problem. There's, there's a problem between what you have regulated and, and what the market will support. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of these groups are putting internal practices in place, SOPs, and they're yeah. creating their own regulations. Right. Yeah, he, he had all that stuff in place back in 2015. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's something that I think is going to provide for opportunity for people to lift themselves out of difficulty. And, you know, as long I know, all I can say is when I went to Ontario, there was lineups in pretty much every shop and there was 
shops lining both street. And I said, you know, yeah, as long as this is something that is in line with the expectation of the community and they want to do it this way, man, it's a beautiful thing to see them be successful and to see our government just be like hands off at least. Yeah. That's, that's when I think that they do the best, frankly. Yeah, I'm not sure about no hands off there because, you know, there's always, there's all, always uh, politics between sort of the, you know, the, the band council and, and the government yeah. pointed and, and it's just, it's a, uh, there's been a lot of tension there that way. And it's like, and I don't think that reflects actually how the community feels. It's been, it's been politicized and, it, and it's, and it's become a political issue. And I don't think the government's blameless in that. Um, you know, I think uh, particularly when it comes to retail, basically the federal government just kind of went, you know what, it's retail deal with the provinces. <laughs> like, they're like, Oh, we'll give the provinces retail jurisdiction. And then they can fucking deal with the first nations right, and figure something out. But yeah. of course that doesn't go far enough because you know, you've got all these nations that want to grow their own and maybe do some different things with it and so it's um yeah i think i think we're just starting to grapple with this issue it's it's going to be a long time before it's actually sorted out effectively i mean if you look at at um the indian act it's still called the freaking indian yeah. act right? yeah. like if you want to know how much progress is being made on it right so it's um you know with, there's there's still a lot of structural foundational issues that we need to fix before we can get anywhere close to a decent solution do you think that uh, uh, this will be the last question because we've gone full circle now. We've gone to the past, to our present, and of course, zeroed in a lot on Canada and on our current situation. I like it because, you know, like we were saying, the concept of past and future are intertwined, right? And a lot of native, uh, a lot of native language and philosophy. So we're thinking that way right now. And Jamie, do you, when you saw what happened in New York and they launched those laws that have a lot of social justice dimension to them, a lot of... Uh, let's say they're not doing reparations, but they're definitely trying to write it in a way that is inclusive of people that have been excluded from the center and really tucked away when they should have been front and center. You know, mm -hmm. do you think that we're going to end up seeing something like that develop in Canada someday where our government says more than just, oh, reconciliation, reconciliation, and then they don't write no. anything into actual practical law that improves situations? <laughs> A perfect example is sort of the difference between BC and Alberta when it came to retail licenses, right? Like BC was very upfront. Yes, you know, if, as long as you meet the requirements, we don't care if you were a store before, if you shut down when you were supposed to shut down and applied when you were supposed to apply and you meet all the requirements, we'll give you a license. Whereas Alberta came right out of the gate and said, if you've been operating before, don't even think about it, right? And, and that's actually where it, the way it's at in most of the country. And so I, I honestly, I think the, even with the equity, there's so many great equity, you know, initiatives in different states and none of them seem to actually be doing the job. They don't actually seem to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. And, and so, I mean, I think the only way a country, for example, some other country that's trying to deal with this, the only way they can effectively do it is, is license who's there. You know, license who's there and fund the communities, you know, that you damaged because I mean, you know, in, yeah. in the United States in particular, it's so grievous because you get a conviction, you don't vote. You know, it was a study and this was in the 80s. I can't imagine it's much better now where it was like one one quarter of black men were never going to be able to vote in the country. Right? And so it's like how how you just so bold face strip people's rights like that is is what's been most astounding and, and egregious about about America's position um and but it's I, I don't I don't know if the equity initiatives are enough I mean I think they're important um in Canada we have it's just not written into cannabis law it's, there's absolutely yeah. no consideration well and this is it Nothing. And this is where it comes down to the First Nations. It's like, you know, if you can't even do it for a sovereign nation, right, then how are you going to do it for a community that you've never really cared about or that you like, like a perfect example is, is Vancouver. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know about Hogan's Alley and how much that not only that that happened, but why and how much it was tied to cannabis and prohibition where you know, Hogan's Alley was, was for those that don't know, was, was a fairly large African-American community uh, here in, in Vancouver. Um, Jimi Hendrix's aunt was from there, right? Like this is, it was a large community. And, and in the 20s and 30s in particular, um, hotels along, on along Hastings, when, when that was actually like the swank, you know, the swankiest street in Vancouver, um, 
Jelly Roll Morton did a residence at Patricia Hotel. Like it was, Vancouver was like a happening spot. And what ended up happening was musician guilds complained because they didn't want these American, re black artists coming up here and performing in Canadian clubs. And so they closed the border for a long time until 1945. Black people weren't allowed to perform in Vancouver. And of course, it wasn't Black people. It was Americans, right? But um, it, it killed the, that vibrant community on Hastings. That wasn't enough for them. They then spent about 70 years trying to zone this, this community out of existence, built a freeway through it so that, you know, it was gone, basically. And now they kind of want to, it's literally the only piece of freeway they built in the city limits. And now they're going to tear it down because they don't really need it because they didn't build any other part of the freeway. Right. And so it's like things like that. Right. And, and it's, um, it, it's really gross like, because anytime any marginalized community gets any benefit from a stupid policy, in this case, alcohol prohibition in the United States, um, they find a way to, to undo it. And, and make sure that they don't benefit from that, and, and which ties into our cannabis um, discussion where it's like, you know, hey, here's this great plant that everybody else in the world has been getting great usage out of, but you shouldn't do it or we're going to throw you in jail because it makes you all crazy, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. Well, can't tell you how much I've enjoyed our discussion, Jamie, and how always, much always. these two sessions I've gotten out of them. You know, I really gotten a lot of personal benefit out of them. I knew I was going to learn stuff and I walk away feeling so much more, I have so many more tools to draw from in terms of like an overarching analysis and all of these different little pieces that you gave me. I really, really want to thank you for taking the time to share all of your knowledge with us, Jamie. You're very welcome. It was very really welcome. fun. I could go on for hours with you. Yeah, same. Yeah. yeah, I could probably just keep on going right now. I know that we're seven minutes over. Um, to everyone out there who joined us, thank you so much. I know it must be all history buffs left right now. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us rant and for uh, having us uh, in your homes and with your friends and in, in, your, in your life. Uh, next month, we're coming back. We're going to be doing uh, probably a, a look into some novel testing technologies. I will confirm this via social media in a couple of days. Jamie, thank you again. And everyone will see you in about 30 days, okay? Hasta luego. Hasta luego.